Okay, so now I put my other hat on. I am the dessert topping in the floor wax today. <laughs> so, um, uh, this is the cemetery panel. Uh, I would like to introduce Pete Angs, who is a longtime member, former chairman of the board of the society, um, uh, just recently resigned as a member of the Oakwood Cemetery Board, and is now doing his stint as the town of Niagara historian. Right? And he's like building that up. So Pete brings a wealth, I mean a real wealth of knowledge, especially around the cemetery stuff, because that stuff was like near and dear to his heart, um, I know, for a number of years. And that place is humming again. And uh, I represent St. Patrick's Cemetery um, that I have been uh, kind of, you know, I'm about seven, eight years behind where Pete is with their cemetery and trying to, um, I'm part of a, certainly a larger group as well, uh, committee, but um, will uh, kind of dedicate it, you know, a, a number of years of my life of really trying to upgrade the, the, the records in this, uh, of the cemetery as well as just the awareness of what, who's in there. Um, so, I'm going to be speaking tonight not only about St. Patrick's, but a lot of the stuff that I've learned about cemetery records in general so that you can apply them to um, your, you know, your knowledge. So I'm going to turn it over to our illustrious guest here, Mr. Pete, and he can rock and roll. All right. Um, I've uh, put together a handout. Hopefully everybody has a copy. If not, there's still a couple left anybody up here. Anybody need any? Everybody got one? Um, I'm more of a reader than a speaker, so I hope you don't mind that. I'm just basically going to read along with uh, you. Um, as Shelley mentioned, I served on the board of directors at Oakwood Cemetery in Niagara Falls for the last nine years. Uh, I left there in June so I could spend more time at my uh, post of town at Niagara Historian. Uh, in April, I recently retired after 22 years at my last job, and I also perform family history research for hire uh, in my spare time. I can't hear you back here. Can you stand up? I could. <laughs> use, that, use that booming voice of yours. Oh, actually, if you don't mind, I'll lean, because i got a bad back, so I can't stand for, for long. So I'll lean. Um, what I put together here basically is just a short uh, rendition of the cemeteries near to me at the western end of the county. Basically Niagara Falls, Town of Niagara, and the Town of Lewiston cemeteries. Uh, Oakwood Cemetery, 763 Portage Road in the Falls, uh, established in 1852. The occupants of the old cemetery at 2nd Main were transferred to Oakwood along with their monuments. That portion of the cemetery is about 18 acres, and the design was courtesy of T.D. Judah, promoter of the Transcontinental Railroad. And the reason that moved to Portage Road from 2nd Main was because the first railroad that came through a suspension bridge uh, to uh, Niagara Falls itself was in 1852, and they wanted to come along the edge of the gorge there, and unfortunately the cemetery was in the way. So as I'm fond of saying, dead people don't vote. So they were all voted, and the railroad went through that portion of the cemetery. Then again in 1855, another railroad came through the other half of the old cemetery, and those people were placed on two and a half acres at the southern edge of Oak Oakwood that was purchased by the town of Niagara, and they still own it to this day. 1855, the town of Niagara purchased this piece of land, two and a half acres, and it's in the heart of the city of Niagara Falls, and it's still owned by the town, which is pretty amazing. I don't know of any other part of the city that's owned by somebody else, but that's, that's part of the cemetery is. Uh, the town ground is leased to Oakwood to be maintained. So they throw Oakwood a bone every year towards maintenance. <coughs> uh, the cemetery itself contains over 25,000 people, and there are many of note. The queen of Oakwood uh, is what I call her, Annie Edson Taylor, 
uh, the 62-year-old school teacher who went over the falls in the barrel and survived. Today's her birthday. She would have been 180 years old today. Uh, died, she died penniless and blind in Lockport at the um, sanitarium. Okay, well, what records are available and where? The primary source is the surname register. The original one is at the cemetery office, but there's a copy at the Niagara Falls New York Public Library near the reference desk on the first floor. It's arranged in alphabetical order by first letter of surname in <coughs> chronological order as people passed away. Uh, so last name, given name, middle name or initial, age, date of burial, lot or grave number, burial permit, and notes. With that information, you can check in at the office for the actual location of the lot and grave. For a fee, one can get a copy of the lot map and, if available, a copy of the burial permit. The permit is like a small version of a death certificate, but depending on when it was filled out and by whom, will dictate the amount of information that's found on it. It may contain last residence address, name of spouse, and or amount of, or, I'm sorry, and or parents, age, cause of death, occupation. It costs $5, where an actual death certificate is $10 from the city clerk's office, which is located at City Hall, and that gives the phone number and hours there for City Hall. And the idea of this handout, basically, like I said, being from the western other end of the county, um, people have relatives that came from Niagara Falls and the surrounding area, so mm -hmm. I thought it'd be good to have a small mm -hmm. reference sheet yes. for people to use yes. if they were uh, dealing with those cemeteries. Um, Oakwood, before I go on, this is a book that I put together for Oakwood. And what it amounts to is it's got the maps of the cemetery. I don't have the big map, but here's half of it here, and here's the other half on the back. When T.D. Judah uh, designed the cemetery, he <coughs> made it into quadrants. So there's 40 quadrants. From west to east is 1 through 10, and from north to south is A through D. So you've got A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, blah, blah, blah. So with that being said, when you look up the person in the records, it will give you a lot number. And what you do is then you look in the handy-dandy uh, piece, the chart in front that I put together that tells you in what quadrant that particular lot's in. So instead of looking at 20 acres, you're looking at half an acre. So it's a little, makes it a little easier to fine tune your search. So there's all the lot numbers mm -hmm. in each of the quadrants. So you go to the quadrant first and then you can more easily find the lot. Because for anyone that's looked for a relative or a friend in a cemetery without mm -hmm. a map, it's akin to a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So something like this is a good finding aid. There's also a copy of this at the Niagara Falls Library. I tried to put together as much reference information as I could for people and put it at the library because the library is open a lot more hours than most cemetery offices. So <laughs> that was the whole idea. That was when I was the friends of the local history department at the library that I first started putting that kind of stuff together. So it's, it's a good finding aid. Uh, next door neighbor of Oakwood Cemetery is St. Mary's at the corner of Elmwood and Portage. Established in 1861 is maintained by Gate of Heaven in Lewiston. Their office is located at Riverdale Avenue in Lewiston and uh, gives the hours and so forth. St. Mary's Cemetery is actually two cemeteries under the one name. The land is divided from east to west by a drive that bisects it. On the south side of the drive are the parishioners of St. Mary's Church from 4th Street and um, 
the actual cemetery records burn. So most of what is available is the headstone reading that Dorothy and Jerry Rowling did back in the 1980s. Dorothy told me that she would bribe the kids with a dollar if they look up so many uh, headstones and give her and her husband the information. So the cemetery records burn. Yeah, the cemetery records burn. So you have the headstone reading. The church office has the death records from 1861 to 2011. So there are some records that will state if they're buried at St. Mary's, but won't give an actual location within the cemetery. We have we have St. Mary's death record, church death records upstairs. The early ones. Uh, at least the early ones. And well, there are a lot in Latin. Yeah, because uh, Church of Latter Day Saints copied the the early ones. Mm -hmm. On the north side of the driver, parishioners of Sacred Heart was located in 11th and South. Their records are held at St. Raphael's once they closed. Uh, this was previously known as St. Teresa's. Uh, their death records go from 1897 to 1999. Same thing as St. Mary's Church death records gives the name of the cemetery they're buried in, which may or may not be St. Mary's. There's people from... Uh, both Sacred Heart and St. Mary's that are buried at Riverdale or Gate of Heaven or St. Joseph's or whatever. So there again, that's a good reference to know where they ended up if you don't know. Uh, so with that being said, as far as St. Mary's Cemetery goes, I, I was trying for the last 10 years to get the Buffalo Diocese to put a sign up at St. Mary's Cemetery. Partially because I felt that the residents there, go back to dead people on folk, the residents there deserve to have their final resting place noted. There's thousands of people buried there. And there's not anything to tell you what that cemetery is. So, more often than not, people would go next door to Oakwood, because it's only separated by a chain link fence. Oh, they must have the records over at that office. So all day, every day, people would go over to the Oakwood office and, uh, can you tell me, uh, Grandpa Jones, uh, where he's buried over, over here? Well, where's that? Oh, on the other side of the fence. Oh, well, that's uh, the Catholic cemetery. That's not part of Oakwood. But as it was, when I first joined the board and saw that that was happening, I put a copy of the headstone reading in the office at Oakwood. So at least if there was a stone for that person, then Tim or whoever in the office could say, okay, here's where so-and-so is buried, and Dorothy and Jerry did it by rows. Are there any numbers so you can count back to 106? No. <laughs> but if, if you want to know where Grandpa Jones is buried, you're going to take the time to count back the rows. And at some point, I think I'm going to go after them to put up some number system or something. But at least there's some reference that you can go to. So, back to the sign. And that was mainly, be, not mainly because of that, mainly because the people deserve to have a sign. But because of the office situation, I figured, you know what? There should be a sign there that clearly states, this is St. Mary's Cemetery, established in 1861, over here are the prisoners from Sacred Heart on the left side of the driveway. Over here are prisoners of St. Mary's Church on the right side of the driveway. So at least people had a clue what this was. And then uh, probably uh, it was springtime or something. I, I had a woman contact me who was looking for her grandfather's grave. She'd been looking for 17 years. She's in her 80s. She wanted to know where Grandpa was buried. Looking for 17 years, she, she couldn't find his grave. Somebody on Find a Grave had put his name that he was buried, that they got off the headstone reading. So she knew he was in St. Mary's. And she lived in Pennsylvania. So she sent me an email. She says, I'm told that my grandfather is in St. Mary's Cemetery, but I don't know exactly where. She goes, how can I find, find him? I go, well, first of all, call Gate of Heaven, because they're the ones that are responsible for the maintenance of the cemetery. So I called Gate of Heaven. She didn't get the, the answer she was looking for. She called me back. 
Sure. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll go and I'll look. Because there again, <coughs> in that headstone reading, okay, it's row 106 out of 133, but <coughs> after getting an idea from other stones that I found that were still upright, I found where her grandfather's stone had fallen and was overgrown, so I was able to pull it up and clean it up and just set it up so I could chalk it and take a picture of it, which I emailed her. She was thrilled. She and her husband came up to visit the grave because all her life, her parents told her that the grandfather was buried there. She never knew where to go. Well, no, her parents didn't tell her that he was buried there. So she really didn't know. Like I say, 17 years it took her to find this grave. So like I say, she was thrilled. I said, Jackie, do me a favor now. Write the Buffalo Diocese and tell them that your grandfather's final resting place in this cemetery deserve a sign because I've been after him. Obviously, my voice doesn't mean a whole lot. But a relative, that's another story. So she wrote a scathing letter. <laughs> I, mean, I, I felt bad. <laughs> she bordered on the lines of uh, meanness. But I, but I told her, I go, Jackie, just do me a favor. And it came from her heart. She, she said, my grandfather had been searching for him forever, and I wasn't able to easily find them. So anything that can help would be good for other people so we don't run into this problem again. And Carm Kaleo, who's the head of the Buffalo Diocese Cemeteries, responded to her and he told her, I'm very sorry about how that all unfolded and we don't want that to happen again. So it got his attention. So I was happy about that. I got together with Carm and Pete Nicosia, who works at, he's the head of maintenance at Data Heaven. And they've got six or seven cemeteries. They just took on one here in Lockport. St. Mary's. St. Mary's. Yeah. Another older cemetery mm -hmm. with not real good records. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were thrilled. But anyways. <laughs> Data Heaven did? Or the diocese did? The diocese. The diocese did. But I don't know who they're going to have maintained if Data Heaven is going to do it or... There were people I think Glenwood maintaining it. Glenwood. Yeah. But anyways, longer story short, <coughs> that sign is in the works. Oh, and good. it's going to be put up and hopefully before the snow flies. Yay. And Jackie, I, I sent her an email today because she asked me how things were progressing. And I told her, Cooper sign is in the midst of making it. And I'm hoping within a couple, three weeks, we'll have an unveiling. I already have a bottle of champagne in the fridge. <laughs> we don't have a lot of room in our fridge, but I, I made enough room for that bottle of champagne, and we're going to uncork it when Jackie comes up and we unveil that sign. Yay. So that was that was a thrill for me that something actually is going to happen. So squeaky wheel either gets the grease or it gets replaced, one or the other. <laughs> so in this instance, it's, it's going to get taken care of. So I'm happy about that. So with that, on that note, if anybody here has any spare time and they have noticed something like that, if you can get after somebody to try to either maintain a, an existing cemetery or go in and help clean it up yourself or adopt a grave and go there and plant flowers in the spring. If you don't have a <coughs> family grave to plant flowers at, adopt one. You know. A, the more flowers in a cemetery, the better. And unfortunately, over the years, that kind of tradition is going away. I mean, it's just the same thing. So, like I say, if you have an opportunity to help uh, a deceased individual in some way, shape, or form, have at it. Who did you say was making the sign? Cooper sign in uh, Niagara Falls, oh, okay. town of Niagara. Because I need a sign made for our cemetery. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they do a nice job. They're not cheap. Right but you get what you pay for. Uh, Temple Bethel Jewish Cemetery on Elmwood, which is behind Oakwood, or uh, next to Oakwood, behind St. Mary's. Uh, no burials since the 1940s, and the only records there again are a headstone reading 
by the Rollings and Feinegrid. There's about two dozen people buried there. Daniel Cohn, a 16-year-old Civil War uh, vet, was the first buried there. And on that note, I got connected with Temple Bethel. Their, their congregation is greatly diminished. <coughs> Only a couple handfuls of people left. Uh, the cemetery, like I said, nobody's been buried there since the 1940s. But the whole reason they bought that plot of land was to bury this 16-year-old Civil War veteran. Uh, he joined as a as a substitute, and I still have to look into the Civil War substitute thing. Yeah. I want to know whose place he took. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't done a lot of military research, but for a certain amount of money, you could have somebody mm -hmm. serve in your stead. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know who he served in place of. But anyways, he mustered in in January, and in March he died in Alexandria, Virginia, in a hospital. He died of sickness, it wasn't of a wound, but it's a 16 year old kid that served for, didn't even fight, and he died a couple months later. So we probed his grave, gently I might add, looking for a headstone, because nobody ever knew if there was a stone erected for him. So we couldn't find anything, so I filled out an application and sent in for a marker form. So I'm hoping that that shows up during the winter and come spring, we can put that marker up for him. He's the only veteran in that little mm -hmm. tiny plot of land. But there again, it, it deserves to be noted. I mean, it's, it's a 16 year old kid. I mean, you have to think about it. It's just sad. Uh, any other local people of Jewish faith? faith may be buried at Temple Beth Israel on Military Road, Habas Shalom next to Whitmer Cemetery, or at Riverdale Cemetery next to Gate of Heaven. I just put that in there. Not a lot of people looking for Jewish people. That Jewish community is all gone to Amherst or Lewiston or Youngstown or well left Niagara Falls for the most part. Uh, St. Joseph Cemetery on Pine Avenue, established in May of 1920. <coughs> Uh, consists of 17 acres with over 15,000 residents. Records are online at uh, MonroeFordham.org from 1920 to 2011. Information is sparse, but cards list the names and locations of their burials. And it tells you how to go to Monroe Fordham <coughs> and look at that. And while we're talking about Monroe Fordham, that was uh, another part of the project when I was with the Friends of the Local History Department. When I became the chairperson of that uh, group, I made it my personal uh, goal was to copy as many church records as possible. Because for some reason, that end of the county never seemed to get addressed. You go to the county historian's office, all kinds of cemetery records for Lockport and the surrounding areas. But you look for stuff for the western end near me, and it's pretty sparse. So somebody ran out of gas, I think, when they were gathering records. Maybe. That's all I can have. But anyways, when I was uh, doing that with uh, uh, the Friends of the Local History Department, we partnered with Monroe Fordham Institute at Buff State. And I was fortunate enough to get together with a grad student that was running the program. Kid was in his 30s. I call him a kid. He's in his 30s. Not now. So I partnered with them, and what I did was I'd go to a church and ask if they wanted to be a part of the program. And if they did, then I would go in and do an inventory. Go in, gather all the ledgers, some here, some there. They're in a closet, they're in a filing cabinet. They're in somebody's house. Mm -hmm. We gather them all together, I'd do an inventory, mark down everything that they had, and then I would present a copy of the inventory to the church and to Chris Root at Buff State. They'd get together and they'd hash it out. You can't copy every scrap of paper, but you copy what's important to the church, the vital records, history of the church, things like that. Um, 
So that's what would happen. Is they'd get together, they'd hash it out. He would take the records to Buff State. Undergrad students would come in and as part of the program, they would digitize all these ledgers. And at the end of that process, they'd take all the ledgers back to that church along with a CD that the office secretary or the priest or whoever put it in the computer and look it up on the computer. You put away these hundred year old books that are falling apart. Every time you open up a page, somebody's name falls off <laughs> or a corner of a page or whatever. So it was a way of keeping those records safe but having a backup copy. There's a flutter of fire and those records are destroyed you don't have them anymore. So it was a win-win situation. And not only they got them on a CD that they could use on a daily basis, put the ledgers away for safekeeping, it was free. And that's expensive. If you have anything digitized, that's, that can be thousands of dollars because it's grunt work and it's time consuming. It's like genealogy, but not as much fun. <laughs> so it was a free deal. So. I did that for eight years along with Buff State. And Buff State, they're in Buffalo. They got hundreds of churches they could have been doing. But what I did was after the first one, I went after the second one immediately. While they were doing the first one, copying the records, I was getting a hold of another church, getting the inventory, putting it in my back pocket, and then contacting somebody else. So when the first one was done, here you go, there's the next inventory. So he didn't have to do any work to find the people. I did that. So all he had to do, all he had to do, was get together with that church, and the process continued for eight years. We had 13 churches done in Niagara Falls. So you go to that website, MonroeFordham.org, and you can bring up those 13 churches, and there's a wealth of information on that, that website. So I was real happy about that program. He lost his job a couple of years ago, so that came to a grinding halt. But it, it went well for quite a long time. Uh, and feel free to yell out at any point with any questions or comments. Uh, Whitmer Cemetery, located at Whitmer and Pennsylvania Avenue in the town of Niagara. Formerly known as Rural Collins Lee or Homestead, this three-acre site was established in 1875. Land was given by Benjamin Whitmer to his children to use as a cemetery in 1840. There again, the original records have been missing for years. The invariable headstone reading, thank God for the rollings. And if you want to contact me, I, I've got cards up here if anybody wants my well, contact I think info. I think that was part of the original. <coughs> Niagara County Genealogy Society is one of their first projects after they incorporated was a cemetery headstone reading project, and that's where a lot of the records upstairs came mm -hmm. from. Cool. And Dorothy and Jerry are obviously were, were, were yeah, principals were, in that, right. and uh, that's where a lot of this stuff came from. Yeah, yep. yep. Yeah, so like I say, if anybody has any questions about Whitmer, or any, anything else is fine, get a hold of me. Um, but Whitmer, there were people buried, there was a Young's Cemetery, near where Jacoy's collision and Aldi's next to the throughway. When the throughway came through, they had to get rid of that cemetery. It's just like the railroad, but worse. From what I heard, from what Dorothy told me, um, those, a lot of those stones ended up in the spoil piles in Lewiston, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Some of them got moved to either Oakwood or to Whitmer Cemetery. But uh, from what I've been told, some of the stones didn't make the trip. But I don't know if they actually exhumed anybody from there or not. It was like 1955 or 57, something like that. But Young's Cemetery was right there by the throughway. But there weren't, it was more of a family cemetery. So I think most of them probably ended up down at Oakwood. Uh, Havis Shalom Cemetery is next to Whitmer. That's in good shape. Uh, that was a temple on East Falls Street that went back to the 1930s. There's a list of people buried there, and as town historian Abba Key, 
pardon me, so if anybody wants to get in to pay respect or take pictures or mosey in there, let me know. I can meet you and then let you in. Uh, town of Lewiston. Memorial Park is on Military Road, office hours and days. Established in 1929, records are on file at the office. There again, I did a map and name register that's at the, by the reference desk at the Niagara Falls Public Library. Uh, Riverdale, records are in their office uh, and the local history department at the Niagara Falls Library on microfilm. And those records uh, are 1896 to 1983. Uh, next door, Gate of Heaven, the Catholic Cemetery, established in 1897 as part of Riverdale, originally, covers 32 acres. Records are at their office. And like I said, they're responsible for maintaining uh, Gate of Heaven, uh, St. Mary's, Olivet, I think. There's, there's like six or seven in the area. Lewiston, Niagara Falls, Uh, oh, and Holy Trinity, which is their next door neighbor. Another uh, Catholic cemetery, primarily uh, people of Polish extraction. And most of them came from Holy Trinity uh, Church on East Falls. Uh, I have a list of burials that includes death date, internment date, age, section, lot, grave numbers. I'm trying to get copies of the maps. I was in there last week asking if maybe they had something in a digital format that I could print out to share with people. So um, I'm hoping that I can get copies of the maps to go along with the other information. Because there again, without a map, it's difficult to find somebody unless you already know where they're at. Uh, and as a side note to the Holy Trinity, if anybody has anybody of Polish ancestry, I personally have records from the International Institute that contain information on hundreds of Polish immigrants who went to the Institute for Assistance. Uh, and that was opened in 1919. 1919, right after World War I, they, um, w, YWCA uh, came up with uh, an idea of how to help immigrants assimilate into the United States. Because at that time, there really wasn't, other than if they came and went to a church or something like that, there was really nobody to assist them. So in 1919, they opened up hundreds of uh, these international institutes. And the only one that I know that's even still around here, the closest one, is in Buffalo on Delaware Avenue. And that's been in existence for the last hundred years. The one in Niagara Falls, 1919, opened up in what was a macaroni factory on East Falls Street. And then this woman came in and uh, ran it for a few years. She got sick and passed away prematurely. But she got this institute started. And there's a woman coming in and dealing with uh, Catholic priests and so forth. It wasn't an easy road. But she came in and she stuck to her guns and she developed this institute and uh, it was originally for women because women had the hardest time, especially if they came in by themselves or with the kids and the husband wasn't there to help. Um, so it started out for women and eventually it morphed into helping all immigrants. So you would go in there if you had an immigration, naturalization issue, citizenship, needed coal for the furnace or any number of issues, but they had all these people there that worked at the Institute that knew all the different languages. So you weren't having a problem trying to deal with people that didn't speak your language. Here, this was a godsend for these immigrants. Most of them didn't speak English at that point. They learned it, but this was a way for them to get help. So the International Institute was a great uh, organization. Eventually, the last place it was was across from Labuda Funeral Home on Portage Road. The building was up for auction 
somebody bought it years ago. But it became the girls' club back in, I think, the 30s or 40s. I'm not positive. But somewhere around that, it turned into the girls' club. And then they joined with the boys' club. So it became the boys' and girls' club that went to the city market, near the city market there. I think 17th Street. But the International Institute sort of faded away in Niagara Falls. But it had a good 50-year run. And I ended up with those records. Dorothy was in local history at the library back in the 80s doing some research. Some guys came in and told Don Loker, who was running the history department at that time at the library, oh, we found a bunch of boxes of papers out at the curb on Niagara Street. Do you think you'd be interested? Nah, nah, I've got enough stuff here to deal with. So, Dorothy heard, she went with them and discovered all these records, those binders of all these records. Somebody at some point, when they went to get rid of the paperwork from the Institute, kept anything that had a Polish surname. If it was German or Irish or Syrian or whatever, or Italian, those all went away. But somebody wanted to keep the Polish for some reason or other. But at some point, they were done with them, and they put them out to the curb. And if these guys had come along, and Dorothy hadn't heard about it, we wouldn't have those records. There's, I think there's almost 500 families of Polish extraction mentioned in these records. And it goes back to the old country, because these were the immigrants coming in from Poland it tells their birth date, the village that they were from in Poland. And for people doing Polish research, it's not always easy to find out where somebody came from, especially if it was an early immigration. Until the 1920s and 30s, they didn't mention a whole lot, especially in naturalization records. It would just say they gave up their allegiance to the ruler in Poland. It wouldn't say where they came from. It just said they, I came from Poland. But these records are a wealth of information. I keep them in my possession because there's sensitive things in there. The wife went to the institute because her husband was drunk and he beat her. I mean, there's things like that. I, I can't just put them out there for people just to leaf through. But if anybody knows anyone that had any kind of Polish connection, <coughs> to Niagara Falls or the surrounding area, please let me know and I'd be glad to make copies and give them the information. I just can't willy-nilly give out stuff that's sensitive and personal. So with that being said, like I said, if you know anybody that's got any Polish connections, please have them get a hold of me. I'll be glad to uh, see if I've got information on it. Uh, last... Uh, but not least, Temple Beth Israel Cemetery, opened 1908, is located on Military Road to the north of the power plant reservoir. Persons from the original temple located at Cedar Avenue are buried there, as well as the subsequent temple on College Avenue off Lewiston Road. I have a list of bur uh, people buried there, but no other information. All Two out of the three temples <coughs> in Niagara Falls, actually three of the four, original temples have closed. The last one, Temple Bethel, where the Civil War vet, 16-year-old uh, kid is buried. Like I said, they have a handful of people left. They're looking at what they're going to do down the road in the not-too-distant future about closing their temple. And then there'll be no more temples. I mean, it, it's just a fact of life with all the, the organizations, whether it's a temple, a church, the Rotary, the Lions. It, it's happening everywhere. All these organizations, you can't find people to volunteer and help. It, it's, it's sad. I don't know what's going to happen. All these churches are going to close, the lions and all those. Yeah, it's already consolidating. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing. Any questions or comments? Fire it well. Ladies first. Do you have any information on uh, cemeteries in Bergholz? Uh, 
not mm -hmm. offhand. Um, we may upstairs. Yeah, there's I think probably we have something upstairs. Holy Ghost or yeah, there's Saint James, yeah. I think, and Holy Ghost. Yeah, I think there are probably something upstairs. Yeah, we you know one of the things I think that we want to emphasize a lot of these records that we're talking about are you do, you can't always find on the internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the thing that we've been trying to do with our library is to really promote one of a kind stuff that you have to you know that's only here. And a lot of those uh, church records, especially, and we have a lot of death and mm -hmm. church records upstairs. I was just kind of looking at the collection again, and uh, it's worth a trip. Mm -hmm. uh, to come here to see this because you can't go on Ancestry and get it. And maybe on Family Search because they came and did a lot of filming. Um, there is some, you know, a lot of films that were made and they were made in the 80s and they um, went up to about 1917 because it was that 65 year, uh, you know, buffer that they gave. So there are some online Niagara County church records uh, which is in this handout that I. Mm -hmm. FindTheGrave.com yeah. so. has quite a bit too on those cemeteries. But they do, but I, I, I want to caution you about Find a Grave. Mm -hmm. They are very, they're incomplete. Mm -hmm. right. Most of mm -hmm. those yeah. records are incomplete. And I know myth, most of you probably know that, but I just, anytime, I've heard people go, oh, it's not a Find a Grave, so they're not there. I'm like, ah! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not true. Uh, just for example, uh, St. Patrick's Cemetery, um, this time I looked, 3,300. There's probably, 11,000 burials in St. Patrick's. And not so, necessarily correct. Right, and they're not right. Exactly. They're, they're, they're probably, you know, more so than that. A lot of those are based on headstones and so forth. But just a caution. You know, that's a great place to start. There's a lot of great information on buying the grave. But the question was about St. Mary's Cemetery in Lockport. You said the diocese has taken over is the source for the records, the Buffalo Diocese? Yes. How do you get in touch with them? Car, Car Kaleo yeah. at the, just look up Catholic cemeteries. It's okay. They're located okay. uh, in the, di the diocesan, diocesan okay. office. St. Patrick's was actually asked to take over that cemetery. Yeah. Uh, All Saints Parish, who runs St. Patrick's mm -hmm. uh, Cemetery. And given the fact that we're really struggling to get St. Patrick's back up and running, we didn't feel that we could take on St. Mary. <coughs> so it resorted to the diocese, the Kern family, for a number of years operated that, that, that cemetery. They did a fabulous job, but then, you know, the, they, the parents aged out, and yeah. so they not turned everything cemetery. over to the diocese. It's not real big. I'm not sure, yeah, you know, and we have partial, actually here in, this, in our office here, we have partial records. Uh, in St. Patrick's, or Saint, All Saints Parish, here in Lockport, that used to be St. Patrick's Parish, they are the holders of all their original, uh, that's one of the merged parishes, so all their death records, all their um, small amount of their burial records, the burial records from there are incomplete, but they also hold the birth, the baptismal. It's all held over at All Saints awesome. Parish. And this handout, and I don't have one for everybody, but it's a um, it's a lookup form, and I actually am the person that does these look lookups. This these are all the records that are held at All Saints Parish, Catholic Parish here in Lockport. It's four different parishes. So if you want to copy, you can also get this online, and it'll tell you how to get that it online. That includes St. Mary's, then. Yeah, partial. Again, it's partial. Partial. Pete, thank you. So now I know what you've been doing for the last 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you happen to know what year Holy Trinity was established? Holy Trinity Church or cemetery? No, I do not. I was just talking to Heather at the Gate of Heaven office this morning. They have problems with their records, which aren't real complete. But I don't know what the time frame, if that opened right after the church, or I, d I don't know that. The church again opened when? Mm, I'd have to refer to oh. notes. As a historian, I'm not very good at uh, retaining information without looking. I only have so much room in this small brain. <laughs> it's overcrowded. But I'll I'll look in the Holy Trinity and I'll let you know. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tactic here. I want to talk a little bit more about generalized records that you're going to uh, that have cemetery-based information because 
the, the information uh, about where someone's buried isn't only at the cemetery where they're buried. It's, it's found, clues are found in a lot of other places. And I, I will tell you, because I am trying to reconstruct the St. Patrick's Cemetery records, especially previous to 1952, because those records also, well, apparently, allegedly, and I still have never proven this, burned, um, 1865 to 1952, their burial ledger burned. And that's the biggest base of information. Mm -hmm. So in reconstructing all the records previous to 1952, you cannot believe how creative I've gotten. I, I, I actually lay awake at night thinking about these things. <laughs> Pretty sick, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Addiction. It's addiction. Okay, so I'm going to start from this, uh, my handout here. This top part of it, cemetery-related information that's generated upon the death of an individual. So I'm kind of taking it from the standpoint of when someone dies, what are the kinds of things that you as genealogists could go out and find to say, because sometimes you have not a clue. You maybe have a name, and you go, I don't know where in the, the heck they are, right? So, um, uh, so the first thing, you know, there's the, some of these things will be common sense, but there's a death certificate. And every death certificate typically has where that body will be transmitted to, the name of the cemetery and the location, for the most part. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but in a lot of cases it does. The ones I was looking at yesterday. They did that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's ex everything I'm going to tell you. There's an yeah. exception to, yeah. but I've seen I've seen this. So you know, you keep your fingers crossed, right? So and that's typically the last thing they do. You go all the way to the bottom. Where are they where are they going to? Um, <coughs> the funeral home. Um, I've been hanging out at some funeral homes lately. <laughs> Sad but true. Uh, the funeral home is usually the first person that's called other than family members because from there everything in terms of the whole burial process, and this is kind of even goes way back to when, um, uh, they generate a record and typically in, a, in the earliest days I've looked at Pruden and Weaver, Pruden and Kant here in Lockport, mm -hmm. I, I've gone and pho photographed their very earliest records, late 1800s up until you know the 1950s. But even the earliest records included who came to order the burial. So you can get some interesting information that way. The name of the deceased, where they were, when they were born, where they were born, when they died, where they died, the attending doctor, when the burial was going to take place. And then on the other side of the ledger, all the little accoutrements that went to, you know, did they have the crepe? Did they have a dress? You know, the, the casket, the costs, and so forth. So, and it's typically a page. Um, there were some shorter entries, but that's a very valuable source. Now, it tells you where they were buried, the St. Patrick Cemetery. I found one occasion where it said what lot they were in. So, again, you don't often find in a lot of these records the specifics. So they're located where in that particular cemetery. You don't find it, but at least this is a good start. Um, Pete had mentioned the burial permit. Uh, this took, the burial permit, again, is, is, is uh, started by the funeral home. And back starting, I think, it was 1880, which is kind of good news, they had a petition, um, they had a petition the locality that the cemetery was in to say, I want to bury so-and-so in so-and-so. So that the city or the town, even if it was a Catholic cemetery, had to start telling the, the, the locality, this is what I, what I was going to do, okay? So, and it started off, it wasn't a, a whole lot of information. In fact, um, this is Glenwood Cemetery. This is a book we hold, and this is called <coughs> Burial Permits. And you can see the information, each one of these is a separate burial, it's a transcription, but it has the name of the person, a single grave when they were buried. Frank Hagg, Lot 90, Section 2, died in Dallas, Texas, buried on May 16, 1912, at the age of 62. So they had to tell the city or the locality where they were going to put somebody. Um, While well, you're talking about burial permits, what happens to them once they're handed into the municipality? That is a, well, where do they go? Well, I've had some experience with that. I'm sure you have. It's not good. 
Um, I, th I was under the impression that they were supposed to keep them. Uh, who is supposed to keep them? The, 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 the municipality was supposed to keep them. He's making record of it. And I'm not going to, I won't go into any more detail, but all I will tell you is that wasn't the yeah. case. Maybe for a while. But. They, I think they kept them for a while and did it. Now, and I haven't really, the next place I'm going to, I got to call Andy, Andy Rosenberg. He's my, he's my go-to guy. I got to call him and beat on that door a little bit more because, um, because you can see you might get more specific information there. He, you know, they make, a lot of times people have stuff and they don't know what they have, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and it, that means you've got to be a little PETA, you know what I mean yeah. by PETA, pain in the, mm -hmm, right? <laughs> but, uh, so that's a, that, that was a critical piece, that's a critical piece of information, but it's very hard to find these burial <coughs> permits. Now today, legally today, they look like uh, you have... On your second set of handouts, you have a copy of a permit that's at the back. That's the most recent burial permit in New York State. It's called a burial transit permit. What happens to that? Well, the, the, you're a church. Whoever is the um, the institution, we got we get is the Saint, All Saints Parish because they oversee Saint Patrick's Church. They get a copy of that. So these will now be on our files. Um, that kind of combined actually a couple of different things. You'll see, you go down this list a little bit, there's a thing called an interment order, number six. This burial transit permit, which is right now, kind of combines a burial permit and an interment order. <clears throat> One of the records that's kept, uh, that was kept, Saint, uh, Glenwood Cemetery does all St. Patrick's Cemetery burials. They are the litter, they dig the hole, right? So they have this little form called an interment order. And it was half of a page, and it basically said, I am so-and-so, I'm the superintendent of the cemetery, uh, dig, I, I, dug, I dug the ditch, I put so-and-so in this grave, in this lot, in this section, on such and such a date, here's her next to kin, here's the lot owner, Here's the cost associated with that. And, and they had, I got those for St. Patrick's Cemetery. I photocopied from 1970 to 2015. Now, interestingly enough, and again, this is kind of, this is not required information with that interment order. This person, Ron Lawbacker, I don't know if you remember Ron. Ron used to be the superintendent of Glenwood. He attached to that interment order it's a beautiful thing, a lot map, where he would literally write in a little mini lot, so-and-so's buried here in 1952, Mary's buried here in 1963, and give you a picture, literally a drawn picture of who's there. Like, this is like, I thought, oh, I thought I was dying to heaven when I saw those little maps. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, very, again, that's... Valuable. And then he sometimes would attach an obituary to that. So he wasn't required to do that. He did that as a matter of his record keeping at, for Glenwood, for St. Patrick's. So I now have a copy of all of that. that. I can't even tell you how valuable that is. Very, very valuable. <clears throat> so that's another way where you can get burial information. And actually, that's probably one of the more specifics. Um, um, Obituary or funeral notices in the newspapers. I collect obituary and funeral notices for especially things prior to 1952 for St. Patrick's because that says, and this is again not a primary record, it's a very secondary record, but at least gives me a good clue that they are there. And I can then triangulate that with other information. Church records associated. So um, if I'm a, a Catholic and I'm going to be buried, I'm, I'm, I'm from one of the four parishes in Lockport, or I'm even from one of the surrounding parishes. And actually, the earlier burials, there's a lot of surrounding area burials, uh, especially from Cambria, because we were the only kind of the first cemetery for a while. I mean, there's some older ones, but we were one of the bigger ones too. Um, St. Patrick's was, but you'll find... <clears throat> Um, church
Church records will tell you um, the name, typically the name of the person, like Catholic, and they're all in Latin, uh, the old ones, not the new ones. Yeah, I've really boned up on Sister Leonardo's Latin class lately, I'll tell you. Um, they're, they're called death records sometimes, and sometimes they're called burial records, because in Latin, what it typically says, the priest who signs it, I, uh, I buried, and this is again all in Latin, I buried, I buried, not, I buried so-and-so, and sometimes they'd say son or daughter of, um, on such and such a date, she, that person died or, on such and such a date at age such and such, received all the sacraments, or didn't receive all the sacraments, and then that was it. Um, so it really focused more on the burial than it actually did on the death, because that was the first thing. I buried this person. So, uh, and that went that way. They're up in, they're in Latin until I'm at least looking. Ooh. And been digging around in those in a while. At least through 1917, they're all in Latin. So, um, and they are online. There are St. Mary's, St. John's, St. Patrick's <coughs> records from the earliest records. Your birth, your marriage, your death, they're online. They're digitized. Latter day Saints, FamilySearch.org. You have directions. Where did I put those directions? They're on, they're on that one. Yeah, they're on, they're on, uh, they're on, they're on this one right here, the lookup one. How to, how to do that? Okay. And again, this is on. You can get this form online. Um, so if you want anything, uh, you know, uh, the online ones go up to about 1917. So if you want anything, you know, after 1917, you can, you can contact me, and I can actually go to the the four parishes, the Lockwood, St. Mary, St. Not St. John's. St. Mary's. Well, whatever's on this list. That's what I can access for you. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Cemetery burial record. That's the official record of the cemetery. And that's really typically more extensive information. Um, date of death, date of burial permit, date of interment. Uh, where they uh, were born, where, where they resided when they died, how old they were when they died, their marital status, uh, the, the, uh, the name of the uh, funeral home director, the vessel that they were buried in, like yeah, the kind of vault. Funeral homes had those? Is that the funeral home has the interment orders? The interment orders? That's the ditch digger has the interment. Whoever was digging oh, the ditch has I the interment see. order. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, at least for St. Patrick's, that interment order. The interment orders, because Glenwood dug our ditches, Glenwood Cemetery has, has our interment orders, and that's what I made copies of. Oh, I see. Yeah. So generally, the cemetery would have the interment order. The cemetery should have the interment. We should have had a copy of all those. Why did we didn't have a copy of those? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. Because when I find out, that we had, I didn't even know about these internment orders initially. And then Ron goes, oh yeah, look, I've got these internment orders. You can, you can go make copies of these. I said, what? <laughs> I said, why don't we have a copy of the internment order? He says, I don't know. <laughs> got to tell you, it's a little crazy. Okay, the other thing that um, a cemetery has is a lot owner list. They, well, they may in various forms or formats. St. Patrick's lot owner list started out as just a ledger. Section 1, Part 1, Joe Smith bought it, gave the date of the bond, how much he paid. That's it. That's all, the, that's all she wrote for the lot owner list. Then about 1900, they were getting a little more deep. They, they made cards. They made big 3 by 5 index cards. Then they started writing stuff on those cards, right? So Or not. Um, and then from those cards, someone, maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, started typing up a little list of, of lot owners. I have since taken from the 1880 ledger all the way through and created a, uh, an access database of all those lots, lot owners. What started out to be about 1,500 is now up to about 3,300 lot owners. 
And why there's more is because people didn't keep really good records. <laughs> they did not keep really good records. The other thing that gave me information is lot owner maps. Pete mentioned a little bit about maps, but in various parts of St. Patrick's Cemetery history, and this is one of my books that I've written on St. Patrick's Cemetery, we have the lot owner maps. Now these lot owner maps are like gold, and they're actually in real life, they're about that big. And I have them pinned on my wall, and I look at them, and I study them, and they've got names on them. So I took and triangulated what was on these maps with what was on somebody's list, and there's a lot of names that were in, on these maps that were not on this list. So what's valuable about these is if I get the name of a person, and I don't know where they're buried, I can't find out that they're buried, I know they're in St. Patrick's, and they have even a, and I've created, through other information, I can determine their, their descendancy or their ascendancy, like their relational pieces. I can go to my lot owner list, and sometimes I can do a best guess. So if I can take all the information that I've already collected about, um, let me think about it. Mary, uh, uh, Elizabeth Mary Coughlin or something to this effect. I can go to my lot owner list and say, is there a Coughlin lot owner? Or what was her maiden name? Because a lot of women, if they were uh, died young, they weren't buried with his family. They were buried with her family. So a lot of times I can discern that as well. So the <laughs> lot owner list is very valuable because when I don't know where somebody's buried, my next best guess is to try to make some sense of it through the lot owner list. And I've actually done, had some really, really good luck that way. Um, the more information I get about a person, the more I can tell maybe do that matching. So the, maybe the cemetery you're looking at, if you can say, hey, do you have any lot ma maps with names on them? Do you have a lot owner list? That's something that you can ask because that, that'll help you. Um, Now uh, here, this was an, the, the last one, cemetery financial receipts. <laughs> she lost her mind. What does that have to do with cemetery records? A woman called me, said, I know my father's in St. Patrick's. Um, he died approximately such and such, but I don't know where he is. And he was not on our, uh, um, Mike Neathy, God bless his soul, and the Stacy sisters actually walked the St. Patrick's Cemetery and did tombstone recordings between 1979, the Stacy Sisters, and 1992, Mike Nathie's work, combined that work. So we had 10 tombstone recordings, about 6,800 tombstones that he recorded, which is just a phenomenal uh, set, of, set of work that he did. Um, couldn't find him in any of my records. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm gonna call Mary Ann, the finance lady, and say, can you show me the receipts from 1969, finance receipts? Hmm. And she said, why? And I go, well, I want to see if there's any Senate lot information, because what do you got to do when someone dies? You got to go buy a lot, right? <laughs> and you pay them some money. So you go, to the, you go to the parish office, you lay some money down, you, you go, you, back in the day, you went to a map, and you go, I want that one right there. Lo and behold, I said, Mary Ann, go through those 1969 receipts. And she got the 1969 bulk out, found his name with the lot and the section on it. And I'm like, bingo! It's like, <laughs> you find the lot stuff, so I know where this guy's buried now. So he didn't have a stone show? No stone. He had no stone. No, she had no information, like she didn't have her deed. That, that's one I haven't added in there, lot deed. You get a deed when you, you buy a lot. But this, this would be, if you are having trouble finding someone buried, you kind of know where they, they're in that cemetery, that is another option for you, and you know when they died. Say, so would you, you could ask the parish person the question, do you have receipts that may have recorded you know, lot purchase information for a particular person on a particular day. Maybe they say, well, yeah, I never thought it. My finance person at the office, she never thought of that. I, wo I woke up one night thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the epiphany of the...
All right. So anyways, time's running out. I've written a lot of detail here for you, and I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm going to kind of wind it down right now. What, uh, just let me tell you what I've done here for you. Just some facts about the cemetery. Um, if you, I have a couple books. They're for sale um, tonight. Uh, you're welcome to purchase, and if I don't, I have two. I have a volume one and a volume two for sale. I actually have two sets if, if anybody's interested. There's a lot of information in here. There's a lot of owners. There's uh, names of people. There's biographies that are written by family members. There's a lot of history of the cemetery in here. Um, and there's all the lot maps, which are, again, very helpful. Um, I've gone into more specifics about the kind of records that St. Patrick Cemetery has and some more detail for you. Uh, and what I've done is something like what Pete just did for you on the, on the third and fourth pages. For Eastern and Niagara Catholic churches, you know, the Catholic church has gone through great changes relative to consolidation. So what I've tried to do in, on pages three and four is to give you idea of other Catholic cemeteries in the eastern end of the county and who operates them now under you know, a different umbrella, because it used to be St. Patrick's Church ran St. Patrick's Cemetery. But we're not called St. Patrick's Parish anymore, it's All Saints. Well, how the heck are you going to know that, right? So this will help you a little bit uh, to kind of figure out <coughs> that craziness. So, uh, any questions? John? Yeah, there is, um, I happened to cross in the county clerk's office where the, you know, the deeds and mortgages are, right. the old map books, there are some cemeteries in there with lot names on them. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Like the old map books? Uh, we're talking. <coughs> we're yeah. talking afterwards. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> you, know, you know what else I wanted to tell you? Um, we did ask uh, Craig Harrison, who's the superintendent of Cold Springs, who's, who's very help helpful with people who want to find people who are buried there. And Mike Neathy, who has been working uh, to um, walk and uh, uh, digitize and so forth, Cold Springs for the last 25 years, Mike just got named to the superintendency of the Glenwood Cemetery. So we have a huge friend. I mean, I can't even tell you. And here's what he wrote me a little email because we asked him to speak and he's at a board meeting right now, so he, he couldn't make it. Um, I'm just getting started here at Glenwood. I'm learning the record keeping system, which appears to be in excellent condition. Um, please announce at the meeting, I like helping people find their grave sites. So, because a lot of times you're in front of these people, they ought to talk to you guys. You're crazy. Um, not only at Cold Spring, but Price Cemetery is a subset of Cold Spring Cemetery. Price Cemetery is in that, if you're going along Cold Springs Road, it's the last section before you go over the bridge. If you look down, that's Price Cemetery. It looks like it's part of Cold Springs, but it's actually Price Cemetery. Um, Shelly, we do have an updated list for Cold Springs. I did. Is it part of Mike's? Awesome. No, it's, they, they, gave, they gave it to me off the computer. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, like 1977 something onward. Oh, good. We'll have to, we'll have to redo it up there. Um, so he can help you with Cold Springs. Um, he can help you a lot with price. He's got all price. And he's actually offered to allow us to copy his records and get them over here, which is you know very nice of him. Um, let's see. Uh, but that, I, I can't even tell you what great news it is, because Glenwood's been going through a lot of changes since Ron Laubacher left. And it, it's been a tough struggle for them to find someone who really is into what we're all into, right? And he's the guy, I'm telling you, he's the guy. So that's very exciting uh, to was know he that. The chief of police? He was the chief of police. Yes. <laughs> oh, was. Yes. He so was. He resigned. He's retired yeah. like we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, and please contact me uh, regarding, you know, the four parishes and St. St. Patrick's Cemetery. I'm, you know, uh, I'm happy to help you with all my updated. I send an updated database to uh, uh, my parish, you know, parish people, so that they can keep it every other week. So I'm, I'm working on that right now. Uh, I'm up to about 8,400 names in my database. So we're, we're moving. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. What a great crowd! Wow. Thank you for coming. Out. Please help yourself to some delicious donuts and cookies.
of these and punch.